So you who are, you probably would have taken this out. Can I but, sign in? Oh, I'm a perfectionist. I, I know. just ripped out half of a blanket. <laughs> you know that they're different colors. Do I know that they're different colors? This is see. darker than this. Yeah. I don't see it. It's a different dye I must have gotten two different dye yeah. Now, what about, but you know what I said? Not to People it aren't going to know this. She, it's a little girl. She's going to get it dirty. So then it'll last. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. It's, yeah. It's a different dialogue. I see it very clearly. I see it also. But I didn't see it till I was about halfway up. I don't have any more of this. Oh, I don't so know. I, I usually maybe forget it. And... I usually check dialogues, you know, that I have the same. And maybe when I was in the store, I said, oh, <laughs> it looks so similar, you know. But when you put it together, yeah, it's see, obvious. It's, it's it very is. obvious to me. The me thing so. is, is this this part is also dark, so it matches the end. Mm. How, long, so how much more is it going to be? Maybe it could be. Um, I think much she more? won't know. My People won't little notice. Little seven-year-old. <laughs> they won't notice. Um, probably about that much more. Oh, you do have a lot more. So they won't notice. I mean, I noticed, and I, I go. I second up, but, uh, but I didn't think I had more of this because when you put them next to each other, you know, just checking the one strand, you it don't looks see the same. it. And I didn't have the lot number with this one. Oh, so actually, this and this are the same lot number, and this is a little bright. It's not worth pulling it out. No, right. so that's out. what I said. Yeah, it's, not it's not worth it. it. It's not worth it. My little seven year old. Yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah. Mm. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hello. Oh. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank God. The bar is not coming. She's not going to go. It's that time of year, right? What? It's that time of year. Yeah, you know, she wasn't feeling well to be straight up. She got the doctor's money. Yeah. Did you knit that yourself? What? You knit that vest? No. Actually, my mother did. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. The, the, the no, vest. the vest. My That's mother beautiful. made it a long time ago. And when I was back at my sister's house, my mother passed away a long time ago. Um, she said, oh, do you want this vest? So I said, yeah. Is this on? It's, it's on. I don't know if they started yet. It said recording. Oh, really? Oh, I think it picked up everything. <laughs> Is this that waterman here? Or two? Well, we will start. I knit. So I was the knitting shear. The knitting shear. Oh, uh, you knit too? I yeah, I knit and crochet. You have lunch and learn. Lunch and learn. You have to think of some kind of like word game though, so it like goes. Yeah. Like, knit and know. Ah, <laughs> <how's that? laughs> I want you to know that my mother, I she was here one time ago, so she, um, my brother and my sister <clears> both came in a sweater. She knitted, she knitted beautifully. And then for me, she never finished one for me. So when I had Ola, my daughter, she started making her sweater. And she never finished the up. And I had what she had started, and I had taken it, and I had I held on to it for a while. And I thought, like, let me have someone like finish up the sweater there and forward and wear it. They gave it to somebody in the state, and they said she'd be too intricate, uh, stitched, they couldn't like follow what she was doing. And then I brought it here, and then I kept saying, everyone's knitting here, so someone can help me out with it. And I can't find it. I'm so upset. I have to search my house and see if I can still find it. Mm. Because if I could, I would love to finish it. And I did it. And I have a oh, it's very cool. And you know, even if they don't do the same stitch, just to do some habit. Yeah, yeah, yeah just do fun. like a regular. Yeah. But I can't knit. I just, last night I decided, I, I do plain like knit for a light outfit if you fancy, but last night I was like, I'm going to try a pattern. So I sat down and I went on 
Oh, good. Thing, and it was actually really fun. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, it was really hard for me though to like blindly follow instructions that understanding how it's going to look because I'm so used to like doing oh. things that I can like vision what it's going to look like. And I was just like counting and doing exactly what it said. But it was, it was, oh, you yes, it is. It. Then you'll, you know, you'll love it. Once I get the pattern, then I'll yeah. do it like, like once I get it. Mm -hmm. But the first couple of rows when I was just following the instructions and not like seeing how. Like I was nervous that it wasn't gonna that I was gonna like miss a stitch and it wouldn't match up because like when I know what I'm doing then you know you know it is if you yeah. make a mistake or whatever. But anyway, I think I would be obsessed that I have to finish it finished. Like you know I want to see it finished. Yeah. Mm. So, so I've actually I've do you trained do some. No, I guess not. I saw. That's also cool. So I've trained myself. It used to really bother me like something didn't come out. I'd like. Like you know, I didn't like make it anyways. Now I just rip it all out and start all over. So, like I don't like it. I just like so I definitely I don't mind it not being finished. Like it's like I'm learning a skill. Right, it's a learning skill. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Anyway, it's January 16th, I think. I don't know. 16th. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's Parashat Ba'era. Um, and we're gonna do some makot today. Um, just letting you know that this morning at seven in the morning, I was cleaning out the name. That's my job. I'm like waiting. So when I think of the car, I'm like, okay. So I was actually so proud of myself that I checked my kids this week and they went all clean. Uh, and I was like, oh. so, so the first time you checked it, I, right. Some I, people need to start there. Right. But um, one of my kids had last week and it's gone. Keep that going. But anyway, but I was telling him last night, I was I was checking his hair and I was telling him that we're going to read about Kirin of the uh, Yes. I said, who had Kirin of the And he's like, me? <laughs> I was like, no, 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 not you. <laughs> we have like these philosophical questions. My four-year-old, four and a half-year-old, so like, He's not so into wearing a kippa, but we talked about talking about how kippa reminds you that I love you. So one day on the way to Gan, I was trying to convince him to wear kippa. So I said, "Remember why do we wear kippa?" So he says, "Because Hashem is under the kippa." And I said, <laughs> "I think you mean Hashem is over the kippa." So he said, "No, Ima, Hashem is everywhere. He's also under the kippa." <laughs> 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 Just tell her to figure the kippa. Chance of getting a little less. <laughs> <laughs> the big one. Okay. Anyway. So, um, so the parsha starts with Ba'era, and um, it's interesting how last week's parsha dealt with Shemot of the people, and here we deal with Shemot of Hashem. So this week's parsha really kind of starts with how Hashem appears. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the, we confuse sometimes this parsha name with Ba'era in Tereshit for a good reason, because it's referencing Ba'era, meaning when Hashem says here Ba'era, it's saying, I did in the past, appear to the Avot. And Vayera is obviously not the only place he appeared to the Avot, but it is actually referencing the appearances that were in, um, in Bereshit. And, um, and it says, And he says, he appeared to the Avot in the, in the name El Shaddai and not in the name Yudkevat. And there are a lot of discussions about what the difference is. Um, I'm gonna suggest one idea that I think is probably one of the more common ideas that um, that UK Vavke is a special appearance that Hashem appears to Am Yisrael. It's a very personal relationship and it's connected to miracles and to things that are outside of nature as opposed to El Shaddai, which is more related to um, appearing inside of nature. Meaning this is, um, this Parsha is a par the Parsha where Hashem really starts um, what we call Nisim Gluim, right? Um, apparent miracles and I don't know if we'll talk about this, this week or next week, but one of the discussions about miracles is how we relate to miracles and, um, and this relationship between miracles being like very much a part of nature or very little a part of nature. Um, and I guess we probably will talk about it a little bit because the makot really brings it up. So whether or not we look at the makot as something like very miraculous or like more natural is kind of a decision, right? So um, if you read Arab Medan's book, he likes to try to prove that all of the makot were kind of an extension of nature, meaning he, he likes to like show how you can kind of explain the makot naturally, but say that this was like, because it was so extreme, it's not natural. So the example he gives, he, he in class, he takes a plate of water, he's kind of the opposite, not the makot, but like he takes a plate of water and he blows really hard and it splits, right? So he says, look, nature is that when there's a strong wind, the water splits, right? 
but when our whole, you know, yam split, that's a really big deal. And that's using the laws of nature in order to create a miracle. Meaning Ramadan likes to take this kind of middle ground to say that, yes, the miracles often can be explained by natural rules, but the fact that they came at the right place at the right time and at this, you know, in this way, that's, and anyway, but this week's Parsha really kind of is entering this new mode, this mode of, um, of, of, of miracles. And I'm gonna say that this mode of personal communication. Okay, so uh, bear with me. We don't, you don't have to accept that idea, but I think that that's kind of where we're going. Um, and we also, we also <clears throat> there are that we make like on certain miracles, like of nature. Mm -hmm. But like let's say the Kesha is something that comes all the way back from the time of the Rishi. There, there are certain things that I think that are also miraculous in nature that we see and that are above Teva. Right. right. So, so there are brachot we say about beautiful occurrences that are considered natural. Like, we don't think we consider a rainbow a miracle, but we consider. So, we're it, saying it on the beauty, not on necessarily it being miraculous. Right. So, there, there's a bracha, Osema Tevereshit, right? That we say in right. all kinds of natural occurrences, but they're like, wow, kind of natural. Right. Okay. So I think part of the definition, right, the fact that we say Osama is assuming that it's not outside of nature, right? It's, it's something that was created. Um, we have Shasani Nes that's that's miracle, right? So we have both. Um, today we don't have, I think, what we call meaning miracles that are clearly um, defying the laws of nature. But we do have um, Nisim that are like the fact that they happen to us at this time, we're, we're very excited by it and we appreciate it. I would say it's according to like the classic definition, it's an Esmi style. You don't think that like when we go to war, like our family, you're know, a happy tragedy. You say you're fighting and there's so many rockets that come in and you see only a few and we're only like compared to the amount. How can we don't recognize that as like a big name like from Hashem? Right. So first of all, I think we should be recognized. I, I, I think agree. We're but it's not true. nature. Yeah. It's not a nature miracle. But, but it's not an outside of nature miracle. So I think that, that it's true that these are important. It's so important to be thankful for that. Um, but even though it's so important to be thankful, I think it's different than Kiratiyams, for example, which is, again, uh, people can explain it otherwise. But I think the classic explanation is that Kiratiyams was, it defied the laws of nature. Or like okay. Shemesh Begibondom, right? The sun yeah. stood still, right? Time did not move. That's that's like a clear, right? It, it defied the laws of nature as opposed to, like when we talked about Hanukkah, right? So the fact that they won the war, it's a miracle. Is it an eskalui? Meaning is it, a, is it a miracle that defies the laws of nature? I don't know, right? I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, I get it. But the loyal lasting does, is, is, does defy. Right. So, so even that, it depends on who you ask, but yes, I think there are more people that would say that the oil lasting kind of defies the law. <clears throat> yeah. I was just going to say, um, the, the, the miracles that we understand that took place outside of nature, um, and we see, we see the, the picture is, is here for us, but there is a larger picture that we don't see which is the nature, the natural occurrence that happened to cause what we see and identify as the, as the miracle. So the question is, is this the miracle or is this the miracle that caused this? I think that we're invited to always try to look a bit further, but there's only so far we can see. But I think the assumption is we should be trying to look further. And I don't know exactly, I think it's all a miracle. Like, I don't know, but, but I understand what you're asking, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how to answer that. Okay. I, do, I do want to just say that um, there is kind of a machloka between the Rambam and the Ramban on how we relate to miracles. And the Rambam tends to say that everything is nature, meaning Hashem set up the world in a way that all the miracles were kind of like predetermined in a way, meaning Hashem created the world and then he kind of stepped back. And the Rambam doesn't see Hashem as being super involved every second in keeping the world going. I'm um, kind of like he set the ball rolling and he set up all the, you know, which is also amazing, but he set up all, you know, the, the different pieces so that when the ball hit here, it would do this, but um, but he doesn't see Hashem as being super involved in general. I'm not, this is not totally completely true, but just in general. And he, 
in general, he sees miracles as not being a basic part of the way we relate to Hashem. So even if Hashem does miracles, it's not a basic part of our relationship with him, as opposed to the Ramban, who says the opposite. Ramban says every day is a miracle, everything we experience is a miracle. And he says that miracles are a basic part of our relationship with Hashem, meaning he talks about how the, the reason we have to remember it's yet time every day is because because it's a basic piece of you know our communication with Hashem. And he says, they will we put fill in between our eyes for our minds remember that Yitzhak Mitzrayim is a big miracle, meaning the Ramban sees miracles as a big part of our daily life and a big part of our relationship with Hashem as opposed to the Rambam who sees it very differently. The Rambam sees everything as a miracle? No, the Ramban. Ramban. And the Rambam, right, uh, focuses mm -hmm. more on Hashem working through nature. But I think that seeing miracles is something that gives hope, but it also <clears throat> gives what we hope. And that's why I think there's a fine balance between the two. So they both are correct, but we need a little bit of both. Yeah, and Shibim Panayim, apparently we need both. <laughs> right, I have suited to like spend the night arguing about this. And yes, yeah. Anyway, um, okay, so this week's Pasha, the beginning is kind of like a restart, which is kind of funny because we already, Hashem came to Moshe and he gave him this, you know, this shlichut. And I started over again. The reason it's kind of starting all over is because that's this parsha ended with the dip, meaning Hashem sent Moshe to speak to Paro and to Am Israel, and Paro made the work harder. And this week's parsha starts with Hashem kind of recharging Moshe's batteries and reminding him that, you know, he's, I'm Hashem who spoke to your forefathers and I will save you. And this piece, the parsha starts with the Lishon of Geula, right? It's, it's here. Um, <clears throat> and here Hashem is, is reminding him how it's going to end. And he's, he's talking about bigger picture. So Moshe is a little bit in a rut, meaning last week's parsha really ended with, um, with Moshe saying, what, what am I doing now, right? I'm making it worse. And, and Hashem's saying, don't worry, it's going to get better. Okay, that's the Pasha starts. Um, and then Moshe says this in Israel, the Lord Shemuel Moshe Mikot Saroch Mavadakashem in Perik Babasuket, so Am Yisrael couldn't hear him. The, Am Yisrael says, Am, Am Yisrael, it, it, the work is so hard, they just can't hear it. And this reminds us a little bit about how, how last week we read about how they finally daven when they could sigh. So here they can't sigh. They have no breath. They have kotzeruach. They have no space and they can't hear it. Um, why did you matter? I just said because I think last week when he came to power and it made everything worse, that was really, that was really funny. Meaning at the end of last week's parsha, he came to Paro, and then Paro made the work worse. And obviously, I said, "Oh, leave me alone." Right, and and that. it's very frustrating. And he probably felt it was his fault that they made that it was harder. For them. Yeah, for sure, yeah. sure. And I think it's important to remember that there are dips in the process. I think that it's important. And and Hashem, Hashem is, you know, he's he's not belittling that. He's saying, "I understand there's a dip, but don't worry, it's going to be okay." Um, but one thing I think is really fascinating that I never really thought about before this year is that at the end of this piece where Hashem appears to Moshe and reminds him that he is the same God that appears to our fathers, when Moshe comes to the nation and the nation doesn't listen, from here on, Moshe doesn't talk to the nation anymore. Meaning, until now, he was trying to talk to the nation. Without and, um, I think it's with Aaron, but let's see. Oh, no, it's with Aaron. That's so interesting. You commented on that. I didn't even notice that. Um, but I was going to say something else, but I wonder if it's connected to what you're saying. But from here on, it's Moshe and Aaron coming to Paro, meaning the nation is a bystander. Am Yisrael is not in the conversation here from here on until that's where they get all the mitzvahs. But from here on, all the machot are told to Paro, and it seems like they just can't hear it. And I wonder how much of a change in the plan this was. And we'll see the Ramban relates to the Ramban I brought to you, which I think is fascinating. Um, and also the Spatimet. But for me, there was, this is like a new thought to realize that, that Moshe tried to work through or with the nation. Maybe he thought that the Zikinim would be part of his, you know, like crew, but Amitla is not with him. And then he goes ahead and he goes to Paro. But before he goes to Paro, he says to Hashem, right? And Moshe says, the nation didn't hear me. 
He says, how in the world is power going to listen to me if the nation is not listening to me? Which kind of makes sense on the one hand. On the other hand, if you read the Pasuk, it was very clear that Amisla didn't hear him because they're Kotzalach Babadakasha, meaning it doesn't necessarily have to be, it doesn't necessarily have to follow that Paro won't listen because the nation didn't listen. But I think it kind of does. Like still, we're saying, you know, he's their leader or not, he's not even their leader yet, but he's from their nation. <clears throat> and if they're not going to listen, why would Paro listen? Mm -hmm. That's what he now, after he says that, um, then, um, then what's very, very interesting is suddenly the Parsha kind of steps back and gives us the whole family structure of Tzedek Levi. And it seems kind of out of context. And there are a lot of different opinions about why this comes here. Um, and um, one opinion is to kind of strengthen Moshe and to remember where he came from, or to say that, you know, you could do it, you could do it. There are different opinions of, of like, we talked about the anonymity, right? And I think this kind of connects to that, how Moshe was represented kind of anonymously and suddenly here his story is told. And there's some opinions that talk about how, how the emphasis is on that he's chosen for his, on his own right, not because he is a part of this lineage. Meaning, yes, mm. he is the son of Levi and Levi is the tribe that we know later become the tribe of Levi, but Moshe was chosen because he was the right guy for the job. And that's why this appears here and not before. Okay, but it's, it's interesting. We're not really going to go into it more than that, but, but this is interesting how it's very clearly out of place. And what emphasizes even more that it's out of place is that after the whole shoshelet, right, the whole toladot, then the Pasuk repeats. And what and this conversation between Moshe and Hashem, that Hashem, Moshe says, how will he listen to him the time? It comes again, mamash, almost word for word, after kind of like bookends, the family mm. structure. So oh, wait a minute, one thing. Yes. When he's in Israel until he comes to Hashem, he's not together with Aaron. He's not together with anybody. Now, all of a sudden, there's this like kumbaya, we're together and we're doing everything. To, like, like, there's just so many pieces missing here. There's so many pieces missing. And it's like he couldn't trust Hashem. <clears throat> Have I know I'm going to trust my brother to sit there and come with me? It's like, it's, it's very interesting what you're asking. And I think it's fascinating to think. Like, how did Moshe know that he was a part of Amisla? It's clearly he knows, right. right? He goes out to his brothers, right? And I mean, his mother nursed him, right? Breastfed him. Does he remember that? How old was he when that ended? Like, I don't know. There are a lot of lengths that we, we don't know. It's also, I just also, his, Moshe's parents were Levium, mm -hmm. right? So they were not enslaved. So, so that makes a whole different, casts a whole different light on his, whether they can listen to him, right? Yeah. He's never, he wasn't there. He's never really been there. Now, the, the, um, mm. the Paro's command to kill all the firstborns included the Levian, right? Yes. Well, obviously, because we know the story, but I'm just right. saying, yes. Yeah. It's also interesting, someone asked, and I don't know the answer, but I think, like, we don't know how many men there were in that generation. Like, how many men did Paro kill? We don't know. It seems like in the Psukim Shatas that he didn't manage to kill so many because it sounds like we're saying it was not successful or the Khani Web, Khani Plus, but um, it's just interesting. Like, what? So many missing. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so after that, um, they, um, the Makot start, and, and um, also we're told how old they are Moshe and Aaron. Aaron is, uh, Moshe is 80, and Aaron is 83. Um, and and then they, they're sent to give the first mochet, the snake. We're not really going to go into the snake, but then the makot start. And I want to make a few comments on the makot before we go into the topic I really wanted to focus on today. <clears throat> so, um, so first of all, one of the things that is really interesting that maybe we'll go into more next week is the question of hardening Pelo's heart. Okay, so the, the hardening of Pelo's heart is something that's fascinating because it's it's predicted. Like from the beginning, Hashem says that Pelo's heart will be hardened. And then if his heart is hardened, does he have pure choice? Does he not have pure choice, right? I think it's a fascinating question. Um, but I want to point out that there are different words relating to the hardening of the heart, okay? So there's there's and at some point, it, there's also and I really think that the Ramban, I'm going to say what he says, I think it's, it's important and beautiful, the Ramban says at the beginning, Paro hardened his own heart. Only at some point, um, I think Arbe is when Hashem starts hardening his heart, meaning he had a choice in the beginning. At some point, he lost his choice. And there's also a very, very beautiful, famous, I should say famous, there's a beautiful piece in the Rambam also that talks about how 
one of the biggest punishments is to lose your free choice, meaning losing your free choice is a punishment and Paro at some point lost that. He lost his free choice. Now, I think we'll talk about it a little more because our opinion is that he never actually lost his free choice. So we'll, we'll look at it more next week because we'll talk about some of the that appears. But I think it's interesting to see the progression. From the beginning, it says, I wrote it down. So um, in, in Dam, it just says, In Sardar, it says, And then in, no, in, maybe it says both. Oh, in Barad, it says both. And and Bechazak Hashem only starts in Arabic. There's some kind of progression. And there is, I think, a place of holding on tight, Bechazak. There's a place of already being heavy, meaning you're already in a certain motion and it's already like become almost second like nature to, to be in this movement. And, and then there's a place where, where Hashem, you know, that's it. It's too late, no turning back. Um, and whatever, we'll discuss whether there really is no turning back or not, no turning back. Um, so... <clears throat> Ramban said at the beginning, God hardened Pharaoh's heart? No, no, at the beginning, he hardened his own heart. Uh, and only after the first five. Paro. That's, is that what it mm-hmm. is? Well, no, I, I was thinking that Hashem. Oh, oh no, own... Paro hardened his own heart in the yeah. beginning. And then only in Makat Arbeh did Hashem start hardening his heart. But in order to prove that he was not who he was saying he was, that he was a God, therefore this had to happen, meaning. He gave him in the beginning like hardening, but this way I found to show his hand was. Now you want to overstep so that he's even more powerful mm. on his own. All these muscles that came together with it, it's just like part of I think the process to show that there's only one one God. <clears throat> only one. It's interesting what you're saying. The Ramban has a very interesting piece. He also talks about how the different makot have different purposes. Right. So he mm. talks about how um, the first three makot, I'm gonna say it right. He says the first three makot to show that. Um, show that Hashem is, is God, I think. And then the second one to become more miraculous. And I think also they start being more definitive, like between Amikhil and, and Goim. I'm not remembering what he says exactly. Right. So the second one, I think, is the And then the last ones, so the last ones are the more miraculous. It's like, Ani Hashem meaning if there's nobody else who can do this. So right. it's also, also about a progression between, um, between the Makot. Um, so when they come out, it has to be that even the other nation sees the miracle that Hashem does. And the only way they can do that is by seeing the whole mm. and then the finality of it all. Right. Yes. I think that according to according to the Ramban, it, it would have been possible that if Paro had accepted that Hashem is the God earlier, that he wouldn't have had to go through all the horrible horrors he went through. I think that's what the Ramban is. I didn't bring him, so I'm sorry. Right. We're all we're saying this all outside of the text. But I think that that's what he's suggesting. Um, if you want, I can bring, I made a source sheet like of all the opinions that I found of all these different structures and I just don't remember them all. Um, but anyway, I think it's interesting to see the progression. Um, <clears throat> okay, I wanna talk a little bit about the structure of the Makot. So right, we usually divide them, right? Um, in, in the mission of the Gemara, they divide them into the Zach, Hadash, Be'achav, right? There are three kinds of sections. And we mentioned the Rabban who talks about some of the progression in the three. Um, now, structurally, there's something that's very, like there's a pattern that's very obvious. I'm sure you've heard this, or I'm not sure. You might have heard this before, but you really see that each makkah, um, in each, in the first makkah in each set of the three has like a more elaborate warning, and, and Moshe comes to see power with the water, and the second makkah in the set has, um, has a warning, but not the same level of warning, and then the third makkah comes with that warning. Um, it's interesting how there really is some kind of structure that we see in these in the sets. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really does seem to be, to a certain extent, they're becoming more and more severe and more and more confining. Meaning, <clears throat> if Dam, I mean, obviously it's disgusting to drink blood, but they drank it, right? And Sardes is really annoying, but you can live. But like slowly but surely, the Makot become more and more life-threatening, more and more um, affecting uh, like when Arbe ate up all the wheat, you know, it, it's circles closing. Yeah, the circles closing. Um, anyway, that, I think that's interesting. And also, um, there's um, there's one of the things that's interesting in this week's parsha. So first of all, what we said about the separation between um, the the Yudim and the and the Mitzrim. So that is most obvious in Arov. Okay, in the Pesukim, it's most obvious, and I'll, I'll read it um, for a minute. Um, I just one other thing about the progression. I forgot to say that the first few makot the chartumim can do, right? Dam, 
Valdea, they can do. Kinim, they can't do it anymore. And then Kinim, it says they try to do it and they can't. Um, so Chazal say that the that the Chaltumim can, can affect like this layer of reality, but like above a certain space, they can't, which I think also is interesting. Like my father used to say that the Makot, also there's like, it progressively spreads in terms of like up and around and wherever, like where it affects, right? Because Dam is down, Salda is like maybe the next level up, Kimim is already in your body, like slowly it gets on. <clears throat> more more encompassing physically um anyway but the place where it's really um it's stressed that for the first time that there is a separation between the mitzrim and the yudim in the psukim or in arob so it says um da, 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 da. it says amen perikhet ve fleti bayama wet eretz goshen in psukit chet he says, I, I fled the, like a flaya. It means I, right, I, um, I made a difference between Eretz Goshen and Ephraim. And, and he says, One of the things I thought was really interesting to check, I don't know if you remember last week I mentioned that the Nefzib talked about how one of the reasons um, that Amitra had to suffer in Mitzrayim more than maybe they would have had to is because they were mixed in with the Mitzrayim, yes. right? That they weren't just in Eretz Goshen. So I was curious to see what the Nitzvah says here, meaning were only the Jews in Eretz Goshen Aro free, or were also the Jews in Eretz Mitzrayim Aro free? Like you might have thought that he was there, mm. the ones in Mitzrayim would be punished. So no. He mm. says that it's, it, it's, and it's also in the Pasuk, if you look, he says, Vefleti ben Eretz Goshen, right? And also, the Sam Tibdut Ben Amir Ben Amecha. And he says, it, it, the miracle, it's a miracle. He says, the miracle is most obvious that there's a separation with the world. Because think about wild animals. They go wherever they want, right? But if Hashem controls them and says, no, you go there and not there, it's very obvious that that's a miracle. Meaning this, mm -hmm. there's something miraculous about that, that division. And he says, and if in Mitzrayim there are Jews and non-Jews, and the non-Jews are affected by the wild animals and the Jews are not, that's also pretty um, obvious. Anyway, so he says that the Jews in Mitzrayim were not affected by the Makai. That is interesting. Um, and um, just the last comment on the Makot again before we go to the Prashanim. <clears throat> so Barad is really a very dramatic Makah. And what, where do we see this so dramatic? So first of all, it's dramatic because it has, you know, the full-blown warning at the Yeo, right? There's a serious um, Yeo. But also the way it's introduced is now I'm sending out full, full artillery, right? And he says, now you'll know can't come on And he says, um, I'm going to tell you my, show you my strength. And, and then he also mentions Makat Bechorot here somewhere, which I don't see right now. But anyway, in the introduction to Makat Barad, there's like a very, very intense introduction. And there's a little bit of a machloket about whether when he says this, he's bring back to Makat Barad or to the next few, meaning the next, the last set, okay? And the question is if Barad itself is really so wow, or if he's saying, okay, this is it. This is the beginning of the end. And, um, and really the way Chazal look at this last set as being something much bigger, something much more intense, something much more um, wow. And, and it's very interesting that after Makat Arparad, when Paro comes to Moshe, he says, um, he says to Dabin for him or whatever, but he says, uh, da, da, da. also here it says, like the discussion. Okay, and he says, I'm in Pesukhet, I'm in Pesukhet, I'm in here it sounds like Paras doing tshuva, right? Okay, like maybe it's over, maybe he got it, right? And then Moshe goes and he prays, and then it says, um, So after he saw that, um, <clears throat> that, that he, that everything is fine, he, he, he changed his ways. And it's interesting here that it sounds like this might've been the last chance for tshuva, meaning, he, he, he almost did tshuva, he said, I understand, and then he changed his ways. And the next pasuk, it says, meaning it sounds like after this, that's when 
it, it kind of was too late. Okay. So Meaning the last makkah that he gave Hashem, that Hashem wasn't gave. It, that Moshe gave, wasn't it something that Hashem ultimately wanted to do because of what they did to boy what to kill the firstborn? Yeah, like death and death. You're asking a really good question. Um, so it depends on who you ask, but according to some, yes, it, it had to happen, and according to some, um, it, it could have been otherwise. Okay. I never actually thought of the last maka as a negative. It's really presented that way. It's really presented that way, not necessarily about the boys being turned in the water, but the Nibbah Chalit Zayel, I'm not going to before, and then I'm going to put your before, and that. Yeah, that, that, right. Um, it's interesting. I saw online an article that I didn't bring because I didn't feel like it totally got everything. But I saw an article that tried to show how all the makot is not going to be that. Like every makah tried to show how it's, you know, a reaction to something specific that the Muslim did. But I just didn't feel like all, I didn't feel like it was tight. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, some of it would make sense. It, 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 I like the it. idea yeah. of it, but I didn't feel like it, it was tight. Anyway, okay. Um, so I want to read the Ramban with you. So this is the Ramban on the beginning of the parsha, um, in the beginning when Moshe says, right, that Am Yisrael didn't listen and they had Shmuel at all. Okay. Hen bnei Yisrael lo shamu elai, ki lo asit zvarai nishmaim lahem, ve'ech yishmani paro. So Moshe says, um, it sounds almost like he's blaming Hashem, saying you didn't make my words up heard, meaning. How could I, the way I speak wasn't good enough for Amitra. How could it be good enough for Paro? So he says, um, I, I have, a, I have a, a speech impediment. And how can I come speak before a king? So he says, maybe, Paro, maybe Moshe thought that the reason Amitra couldn't hear him was because of his speech impediment. So he says, um, and he and he couldn't they couldn't listen to him because of right, even if he says good things, they couldn't hear him because of the speech better. So the Ramban points out something that I never noticed before that. It didn't say from the beginning that Moshe is going to go speak to Paro. It says, you're going to go to this kinim, and then you together with this kinim are going to go to Paro. It sounds like he thought, according to the Ramban, maybe, that he thought he's going to go with, you know, like the delegates, and he would be silent, meaning he's going to bring Am Yisrael, and Am Yisrael is going to come with him to Paro, and he'll be silent, and they'll talk. Wait, what kinim? Are these the kinim that later So on time? that's a really good question. We don't have Shivi and Skinim yet as an institution, but it seems like there were elders. Because already last week it talks about him talking to Skinim, meaning it seems like there were leaders and they were the people. Again, he's not a part of this nation. He is officially, but like they don't know him. He's been gone forever. How's he going to leave them? So he goes to the leaders and he tells them, I kept this message. Let's go. Come on. Right. He's pushing them. At, right. And they're going to, he's, he's expecting them to take the lead. Okay. Um, so he was he was embarrassed to speak to the nation, but even more so Paro. No, but wait a minute, it pre ends though later on too, because the reason Lestinian comes later is also because he is having a problem communicating with them. He's like overwhelmed. And I just think it's interesting that here he meets them and then later on. This came after, you mean after yeah, when he like points there are things that go on, then he's <clears> like, <throat> so like you need to appoint and you need help because you can't communicate. I just think I'm just interested. interested. It's very interesting what you're saying. Um, I think it's interesting. The Midrash talks about how the fact that they didn't help him out here, they were later punished for. And then at Har Sinai, he went up with that, with that. They were told to stay down with the nation. And that was a punishment for them not like being what he what they should have been here with him. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's very interesting what you're saying. But anyway, so the Ramban is saying that the whole discussion that he had with, with Hashem, was all about talking to the nation. It wasn't about talking to Paro. 
they were both trying to prove that you could have said that he never thought he was going to power. And that's a new thing that suddenly falls on him in this parsha, meaning he was very nervous about speaking in general and he was going to go, you know, speak to the nation. And that was a big deal. But Paro, I mean, what's the deal? That well, was never. Though, if he was only going to speak to the nation, what was his message going to be to them? I mean, Paro, there's a message. Let my people go. The message was that the, the Kinim were going to take his message from Hashem to Paro. Meaning he was supposed to, he thought, or according to Ramban, maybe he was right, that he was supposed to get the Kinim moving and he sent, he gave them a message to relate to Paro. Okay. Okay. Um, Anyway, and again, he's just still proving that it's speaking to the Am and not Paro. He's just saying that all until now, all the conversations that Moshe had had were with the Am. So he came to them and he spoke to them. So part of what the Ramban is explaining is, <clears throat> last week he said it Why are you saying it again? Because last week he said it about talking to Amitzvah. Now it's a whole new mission. Now he's saying, how am I supposed to come to Paro? This is like totally not relevant. And the Rashi Kirish is the Val Mitra Okay. Um, so he's he doesn't he's saying Rashi doesn't agree with me, but I think it's a really interesting angle. And I think it it relates to what I said before about how there was a certain maybe ideal vision of how Moshe was supposed to be to, to maybe the lead the you know the mission, but he wasn't necessarily gonna go alone. He was gonna go with Aaron and with all this Kanim. And suddenly he's left alone with Aaron and and suddenly he's the Where one who wants they? to speak. Where were they? Yeah. So last week's Parsha says that they left. I didn't read it, um, but let me just, I'm going to read it to you. Um, so at the end of Parashat Shemot, um, <clears throat> um, it says, um, it comes to our own, and then, um, and at first it says that the nation agreed, and then, And they do come to power and they say Shlach says no. Uh, and then um, when they leave Paro, so then so then then it says Veyru Shatreb Ne Israel. It doesn't say it's Kini here actually, it says just Shatreb Ne Israel. But the end of last week's Parsha, Am Israel is complaining and saying, Why did you make things worse? Mm. Now I don't see this Kini here. Oh one second. Right. It says it says the shatrim. It says which sounds like they're maybe Jews, but um, but I thought it also said skinny. But there are these people, these Jewish leaders, the shatrim that were appointed by Paro. That when Moshe come at, Moshe and Paro, Moshe and Aaron come away from Paro, they come to them and they say, "Why did you do this? And why are you Lama Why are you Why are you making Paro hate us more?" Um, so again, it doesn't say it's kidney, but it, there are these leaders of the Jews that are not joining, but even a book, they're complaining. So much. Anyway, I just, I think this idea that, um, that the mission kind of switched on him and that the nation not being with him is a big deal. I thought it was very interesting in, in the Ramban. And the Svatimet relates to a similar idea on a different, on a different angle. Okay. So, um, so, so I'm reading the Svatimet. So right, the pasuk says, "I'm sorry, I couldn't hear me because I'm I have a speech impediment. How could Farah hear me?" <clears throat> so it's not even So the fact that says it's not that Moshe had his own personal speech impediment. Maybe he did, but he says that the big thing is that. Whether or not he can speak, it depends on the nation. Meaning the fact that they didn't hear him, that's what created the fact that he's a list of time. Meaning when he says, how can I come to Paro? He's not just saying, I list. He's saying, there's something stuck here. Meaning 
something in the communication is not happening. And if Ami Sled doesn't hear me, then there's something lacking. And it's not going to help if I go to Paro because he's not going to hear me just because they didn't hear me. And I think the statement is a spiritual statement, not just a physical statement. Is this the first time that we become aware of the <clears throat> impediment? We don't know before. Last week. Last week it also said. Right. So, or so that was, okay. It's not news. It's not new. But the Spatha myth in general talks about the speech impediment not being totally meaning. The Hasidim in general talk about part of Mitzrayim being There's something about communication and speech that was kind of blocked and limited. It was in exile. So why don't we say that in Kuda? Like, meaning, like, if that's what it was, it was more like they were the ones who were there. It's not just the speak. Right. Well, I think in general, we're saying that it's all one and the same. Meaning, right. when there's something stuck, there's something stuck. Okay. But he also had to learn how. To them. I, I agree. It was a work in progress. I agree 100%. But, but part of what the Spatimet is saying is that it goes both ways. It's two way street or a one way street, but not him, them, them, him. Anyway, but he goes on. He says, So now he says a general statement. He says the Navi is always somewhat in context of the nation. So when it says, um, when it talks about the laws of who's and the Vietnamese and who's in the Vietnamese, it says, Ki akum nabi mikir becha. So literally, mikir becha means from among you. And he says, mikir becha doesn't just mean physically from among you. It means that the navi is an expression of what's going on among you. So I don't know which nubah he's referring to, but he's referring, a, he's quoting a nubah when the navi says, listen to me, my nation, and I will speak. So again, if you listen, I will speak. Meaning, if I if you listen, I can speak. If I speak, it doesn't work the other way. It only only if you're listening to me can I speak. Right? It's kind of like a teacher that comes to the classroom, and if nobody's quiet, you don't want to start talking because you know that it's not even worth it, right? <clears throat> so he says you don't um, bear witness unless you're being heard. And he says the reason. Um, I said that the Bible didn't happen yet is because they weren't ready to hear yet. So just like I said, the Dibur was Begalut. He says there was something about the place Amisal was in at this point that they weren't ready to hear the words of Hashem. So whether it be Moshe telling the words of Hashem or the Dibur that are, that are yet to come, they just weren't there yet. <coughs> Again, that's, that's um, what we just quoted. Um, so the Midrash says, why couldn't they hear Moshe? Because they were already doing Avodah And they couldn't, they couldn't hear it, meaning again, spiritually they couldn't hear it because they were entrenched. And I think even if you don't say that they were actually doing Avodah they were stuck. Right? We always talk about how it's easier to take the Jews out of Egypt than to take the Egypt, Egypt out of the Jews. And this is what he's saying. He's saying that it wasn't just, they weren't just physically in time. They were spiritually in time. They were spiritually in this sad place. I want to know last night, I've been thinking and talking about a seminar for people like this about going to the Jews and what to do with the thing that happened. And they were showing that the Christians in the country are things are hard for them, difficult for them. So we come like Moshe and speak in a certain tone and a certain language, and they can't relate to that. And they have to learn how to use your words to get the person. And the person in the beginning is also not ready to listen. And it's just like work in progress. You have they as Am Israel have to be ready like to listen because they want the help to come out. And as a person trying to be the helper, you have to also learn the tone that is the right words that have to connect. You have to listen a lot. Nahon. And then you can pull yourself out of this. Uh, and I also did. I also did the what happened? There was a suicide in this rabbi. Yeah. In a, a couple months ago, yeah, there was um, a teenager in a class. Oh, so right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. there's a um, right. It's a movement. It's called um, right a shagrire. Right. It's um, something to uh, feel like it. Um, it's um, they call it EPR, right? No, they didn't do the EPR thing. I, I mean, it's with this guy, she's from Alabama. Ah, okay, yes, I don't know. Oh, he, he lost his daughter. 
Yeah, so, so okay, so there's a there's also a technique they teach. You know, they say that most people, many 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 people um, who are in danger are saved by bystanders, not necessarily by you know professionals. Because by the time the ambulance comes, you know, hopefully the person is alive. But if someone right there can do CPR, then that's you know the most important thing. And they're saying the same thing about emotional. And I think they're calling it EPR. So they're teaching like very concise techniques of if you see someone is suicidal, how you approach them, how you help them. Um, there's like a whole, I thought that's what they're doing. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think not up to that yet, but yes, it is like the introduction to so be aware of <clears throat> right. So last year I took, um, Rupioni Rosenzweig has an organization, um, maybe you've heard of called Magle Nefesh. It's, um, it's, it's like leaders, you know, rabbis and women and whatever in, um, um, he, he's training them to, to have also background in obviously not therapy, mamash, but like some, somewhat in, you know, mental health. So, um, so we, when I, I did this course, we had that, that training. Very important. So the example I was thinking of in relation to this is, you know how they say that like when the Baal, when the Baal, yeah, like whether the Kiyot work or not, it's not him, it's, it's right. It's the community. Like if the kiyot aren't going through, it's because something's left, right? Um, and I think that it's kind of the same idea that like the the messenger, the leader, is only what the people are. If he's connected to the people, if he's not connected to the people, forget it. Then you know we're we're doomed anyways. But but if the leader is in sync, then if something's stuck, something's stuck. And I think that that's kind of related to what you think. Um, Okay, let's read a little more and then. Kama shakatu, ish shikutse enav lo ishlihu. I'm gonna read it on. Then a perush dafka avodah zara mamash. Rak avodah shehi zara lahem. They're saying it's not that they were actually doing avodah zara, it's that they weren't doing something that was real to them. Ki ashmi'a tarikh liyot panui mikol dabar. He says it's, it's that they were not listening inward. They were listening to things outside of them. Meaning, he's saying, Am Yitzhak in, in Mitzrayim, they weren't necessarily actually doing idolatry, but they weren't in tune. And they weren't, they didn't have a clear, you know, their, their, their ears weren't clear. They, they, they were too focused on other things. And again, I think this is exactly right? They weren't focused. They were busy. They couldn't breathe. They couldn't, right? And he says, <laughs> <laughs> um, and So he brings up a suk again, I forget where it's from, that in order to hear Hashem, you have to both listen and lend your ear and forget meaning where you came from. And he says, this idea is still relevant to us today. Can we really hear Dvar Hashem? Can we really make space in our heart, leave aside Hevlea Olam, all the things, Hevel, right? All the things that are like not, they're not substantial. All the world, right? Everything in the world, right? Feeds us. Can we like put it aside and really listen to what Hashem has to say? So again, he's saying that they didn't throw away their Abadah Zara. They were still entrenched in Mitzrayim. He says, if they could have heard Dvar Hashem right away, they would have, right away, they would have been taken out if they were ready. And he says, and today we have the Torah. The Torah came and he says, every day the Torah is being given. And he says, it's a kol gadol velo yasaf, meaning it keeps speaking. It never ended. The Torah is be, being continuously given. And every day we say, Shema Yisrael, what's that, right? We're still connecting to that, right? Meaning, watch my Israel. It's saying every day, which is Matan Torah. And he says, Hashem is still saying it. Meaning, he said it, Hal Sinai, but we're, it's still going on right now.
And he says, what we need to do is when we say Shema Yisrael, is to really Shema. We need to really hear it. And what does that mean, Shema Yisrael? What, listen to what? So he's saying, this is what we're listening to. He says, Hashem is talking. What's going on? And if we open our ears, then we'll hear it. And he says, That's why we talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim before Kirat Shema. שלידי גאולת מצרים יכולים להתפנות מ... אני לא יודע מה זה ארז, מ... זה? להיות מוכן לשמוע דבר השם. זה בגלל שפרט של יציאת מצרים היא להתחילים את הקנות, להשמע את השם מצרים. כמו שכתב, ולא שמעו וכולי מכל צרוח מעבודה קשה, שהוא שליטת הגוף על הנשמה ורוח. זה מה זה כל צרוח מעבודה קשה? my subjugation in the physical world, it overpowers spirit. Meaning, what, what's kosaruach? Meaning, I can't hear Hashem because I'm working so hard. And that's the wrong, right? That's not what we want, right? We want, our, we want mind over matter or spirit over matter, and that's matter over fear. Meaning, that is what kosaruach is, right? And I think we all can right, identify with that, that when we're tired and we can't hear, that's what it is, it's when we're just, and it was so nice to hear from her. She's sitting there and she says, Mom, I love Shabbat. And I've never had any of my kids real. I love Shabbat. She said, I don't feel like I really hear my Shem. I just heard like there's something about it. And like because when you close, and she said, because I close everything during the week. And I can feel him because I'm not doing anything else but that. It was just like a nice thing. So that's I'm this. That's how much this. Right. That's how much this. Saying, right, that's this. Like, and that's what he's going to say in a second. He says, that's what Shabbat is. That, that's the next sentence. That's what he says. That's what he says. She read the Shemaya Terah. The whole ish pone at mo. And call pani milam at malachot. He says, on Shabbat, we have special extra in the Shema. And we, and we don't do the malachot. That's a time when we can hear Dvar Hashem. And I've been thinking a lot lately about how um, Shabbat used to be the only time people could really stop. Like, I mean, Baruch Hashem, we, we, we live in a busy world, but not in the same way as previous generations, where they really had to get up at dawn and do whatever they had to do. And like, they didn't have so much right time. And that's what Shabbat was. And wow, what, what an idea. Like that once a week you stop and you let spirituality enter into your life. And I, I think about it a lot how it's so brilliant to have that time to stop. And I feel like today we potentially have time to stop during the week, but not, not necessarily. And I think it's such a blessing that Shabbat is, is there for that. And I think that that's part of, part of what Fatima is trying to say here is that what they were lacking in the time was that. Now, I wonder, did they have break on Shabbat? I don't know. Um, but I think that I think that the Satan is saying a few things. First of all, he's saying that sometimes we think we can't hear a message because the message is messed up. But usually, if the message has to be heard, and we don't hear it. It's because something something needs to be fine tuned in our ears. Meaning, I think that it's interesting to say that Moshe wasn't a the time because of his own. Lemish, he was a lesser time because the nation couldn't hear him. And that was the big deal. And I think it's also interesting when you follow Moshe and you see later he speaks so much, right? What does that yeah. mean? He's not anymore, right? So maybe they were ready, right? Or maybe also, like you said, he went through a lot of a lot of um, processes. But I think also they were in a different place and they left Mitzrayim to a certain extent, right? We see that they don't totally leave Mitzrayim and still have things left over. Um, anyway, the Svatimet is telling us to open our ears. Open our ears and hear Hashem speak. I once saw a photograph, and it, it has stayed with me all these years. It was a black and white photograph taken of a man, a coal miner, and he was down in the mine. He made Shabbat in the mine, and the picture is of him sitting dirty, but dressed in a white shirt with a white tablecloth really? and making Kiddush. Somebody must have taken the picture down under the ground. In Whole mind. Wow. And it just stayed with me. That's just crazy. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. When is it from? It's 
it must be a hundred years old. I don't know. Yeah, it's an early early photograph from America, you know, American early Jewish history. Mm -hmm. so, I want yeah. you to know that I maybe this is not a record for me, but on Thursday just a few days ago, because I heard a few or years ago oh, okay. from Rabbi Hashem, <coughs> he said that if you start doing something that you say you say on Shabbat, for Shabbat on Thursday, he says when your kids will come down to the desk on Friday morning, they'll already know that the presence is coming. And right away, you do a shift in your mind, and you know, and you start getting into your preference. So I do that. I'm like, just as it does, it like starts to like get the, you know. He's going to that if you have another table seat on him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> and, and, right. Right. Yeah, but it's well, we have the camera. I mean, the truth is, like, sometimes, like, oh, my husband goes, like, oh, wait a minute. I'm like, yeah, not shop. <laughs> it's my thing. And everyone knows they can't start up with me with that. <laughs> it's really nice. So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. On that note, we're going back to the real world. To the real world. <laughs> Thank you very but much. We're kind of taking a little bit of this is the real world, right? Yeah. This is the real world. <laughs> there's a there's a famous I I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it, but there's a quote somewhere that um, and I don't remember what it is, but there is there's a term in halacha that you'll call talk about the alma, the world. And at some point, someone asks, what do you mean the world? I mean, you don't have this whole world. It's not the whole world. And they ask, oh, that's the real world. That's the um, that, alma um, that the world says. What do you mean the world says? The world doesn't know where you're coming from. So look, I mean, you can look for Shabbat. Like, you like to see candles so that you take your Shabbat for the week. We try. <laughs> yeah, we try to take Shabbat. Uh, and that's how we stop on Monday morning when we get a little spiritual. Where are you all going for next class? Better call. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. אני יודעת שאז חיבית בעצמך, אז לא יודעת אם... תודה על עצמי, 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 ת